Uh, so the decision to have Nimitz serve as both the commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet and commander in chief of Pacific Ocean areas, both a, an operational commander and a theater commander has been criticized oftentimes through the lens of individual battles. And I'm going to argue that if we look at it from the perspective of a campaign, then we can see certain distinct advantages from this approach, which I'll enumerate. And this presentation draws from a manuscript I've recently completed. It's expected to be published uh, through the Naval Institute Press on Nimitz's leadership during the war, uh, hopefully coming out this September. And before I get into specific details of Nimitz's approach, I want to provide some background. We heard Secretary Lehman talk about early times in Nimitz's career, and long before assuming command of the Pacific Fleet, Nimitz wrote a thesis on tactics during his time at the Naval War College. And in that, he enumerated four unchanging principles of warfare. One was to employ all forces with utmost energy. Another, concentrate superior forces at the decisive point. He wanted to avoid loss of time and follow up every advantage. And we can see how these principles informed Nimitz's approach when he was commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet and the Pacific Ocean areas. And I'll show how those informed what he did. But first, it's important to tie in some other aspects of Nimitz's approach to organization, specifically how he organized his staff. Nimitz's staff structure was emergent. That is, it didn't follow a predefined concept or a predefined plan. There are a couple reasons for this. One, there was no predefined approach for organizing naval staffs during this time period at the, at the start of World War II. Navy staffs took a structure that reflected the predispositions and the challenges of uh, the leader at the head of it. And so Nimitz was free to shape his staff in the way that he saw fit. Now, at the same time, he inherits a lot of staff members. He sees it as one of his obligations to redeem the officers who have been part of the Pacific Fleet and somewhat traumatized by the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. So rather than bringing in his own team, his own staff, Nimitz keeps on staff members from the former commander of the Pacific Fleet, Admiral Husband Kimball, and the interim fleet commander, Vice Admiral William S. Pye. Now, Nimitz is very aggressive. Nimitz wants to come to grips with the Japanese. He wants to win victories. And so that orientation and disposition that he has reflects how he begins to work with his staff. Officers within his war plan section have a similar disposition. That section is headed by Captain Charles McMorris. He's pictured there on the right, nicknamed Socrates or Sock uh, because of the wisdom he seemed to, to bring to his work. <clears throat> And McMorris helps write the plans for the initial carrier raids that the Pacific Fleet carries out 80 years ago in February of 1942. His assistant is Commander Lynn McCormick. Now, Nimitz lets McMorris go to sea. It's an important step to secure a promotion for, to Rear Admiral. So McMorris goes to sea to command a cruiser. McCormick steps up, assumes command of the war plan section, and Nimitz works with McCormick to thwart the Japanese invasion of Port Moresby at the Battle of Coral Sea in May 1942, and to concentrate superior force at the decisive point and ambush the Japanese carrier force at Midway in June. John is going to tell us a good deal more about that. Now, Nimitz is able to focus his attention on these operations. He's able to concentrate on how to thwart Japanese offensive designs and destroy their carrier force because he bifurcates the work of the staff. He divides it and he delegates more routine and predictable work like convoy routing and training sorties to capable administrators like his initial chief of staff, Rear Admiral Milo Dremel, who's pictured there on the right. Dremel was Pai's chief of staff, he was very capable but he didn't have the same level of risk tolerance as McCormick and uh, McMorris and Nimitz himself. But this bifurcation, this approach that Nimitz takes where he's gonna focus his energies on the complex, the unpredictable, 
and he's going to delegate the more routine to uh, talented officers who oftentimes are in a position of uh, his chief of staff. Nimitz maintains this as the war goes on and as his staff grows. Nimitz is also very effective at delegating within his command. He's able to keep his staff relatively small so that it can quickly make sense of what's going on around him, quickly make sense of the unfolding nature of the war <clears throat> by delegating to theater um, subordinate commands across the Pacific. And we heard Secretary Lehman talk about jointness, jointness in a modern context since Goldwater Nichols. And when we think about jointness in the Pacific in World War II, particularly in Nimitz's command, we need to think about it differently. And I've got all the way down here in quotes to emphasize the fact that Nimitz's approach to jointness reflects the Navy's predisposition to decentralizing execution. That is, jointness, when it was introduced by the combined chiefs of staff, when they decided that there was going to be a single theater commander that would unify all military forces uh, within that theater, Nimitz took that and applied his Navy frame to it so that all the subordinate commands were also joint. Small islands like Samoa, it's a joint command, as well as larger commands like the areas in uh, the South Pacific and the North Pacific. And through the latter half of 1942 and much of 1943, Nimitz relies on these subordinate commands to keep pressure on the Japanese. So in the South Pacific, Vice Admiral William F. Halsey relieves Vice Admiral Robert Gormley, wins victory at Guadalcanal and begins to move northwest through the Solomons. And in the North Pacific, where Admiral Kim Cade, pictured here in the warm jacket because he's in the Aleutians, <clears throat> replaces Rear Admiral Robert Theobald, who had refused to work effectively with the Army. Kincaid's able to collaborate extremely effectively, and that's very important because it allows him to maintain the momentum of offensive operations in the Aleutians. Kincaid is able to convince uh, General John DeWitt, who's responsible for the Western Defense Command, to bypass Kiska because there aren't sufficient forces available to occupy it, and instead at leapfrog to the island of Attu, which undermines Japanese defenses in the Aleutians and secures the opportunity uh, to capture Kiska at a, at a later date. And in the South, Halsey similarly partners with army officers to improve logistics, especially at the port of Numia, guaranteeing success at Guadalcanal and paving the way for the a successful advance Northwest through the Solomons. These offensives give Nimitz the time and the space to begin to prepare for the Central Pacific offensive. And as he's doing that through much of 1943, Nimitz is very focused on avoiding the loss of time. The combined chiefs of staff, the joint chiefs of staff, they are pressuring him to move quickly. They believe that it might be possible to defeat Germany by the end of 1944 and in order to prevent the war from going on too long, they would like to force Japan to surrender no more than 12 months after that. So the target date to force Japan to surrender is the end of 1945. Nimitz is going to have to advance across the Pacific and create the conditions for that very quickly. And to allow that, Nimitz reconfigures his command and staff structure. He's being pressured by the army to create uh, general headquarters, not unlike what General Douglas MacArthur has created in the Southwest Pacific or what General Dwight Eisenhower has created in Europe. Now, these are fairly large headquarters organizations, nearly an order of magnitude larger in size in terms of the number of officers than Nimitz's staff, and they approach jointless in a much more centralized way. If Nimitz was going to do that, and this is what was recommended, he would become the theater commander and someone else, like Halsey, would become the fleet commander. Nimitz chose to do something different. He and Admiral King, the commander in chief and the chief of naval operations, want to keep Nimitz dual hatted. They want him to be the theater commander as well as the fleet commander because they believe that in the Pacific, the fleet can be an arm of strategic decision. It is a victory in a major fleet action could unlock new strategic opportunities, allow a more rapid advance. And so 
they believe it's very important to have Nimitz in both roles so he can couple operational decision-making, tactical victories, and strategic outcomes together by making sure that they don't have to cross layers of the command hierarchy to do those things. Nimitz is gonna be at the center of this. And that's the path that he chooses. You can see the organization of the joint staff that he introduces in September, 1943 here. Uh, the date is down there in the right-hand corner. It's very small, you might not be able to see it. But Nimitz uh, introduces a joint staff. So there's a fleet staff, the joint staff, this more clearly delineates the work at the theater level from the fleet level. There's also an army staff underneath the commanding general in the Central Pacific, who also happens to be the commanding general of the Hawaiian department. Now, in introducing this, Nimitz seeks to address some of the army's criticisms by revising his approach to logistics. He's been sent some talented logistical officers from the Army, one of whom is Brigadier General Edmund H. Levy of the Army Service Forces. Levy has toured Nimitz's Pacific Ocean areas and he's not impressed with how logistics are being done. He's got a number of criticisms. So Nimitz figures Levy is the best person to help address and overcome the deficiencies highlighted by those criticisms. And he assumes responsibility for the logistics division in Nimitz's joint staff and works with other officers who are already in the theater to revise the approach that Nimitz employs to logistics and create an engine that is going to allow the Central Pacific Offensive to maintain its momentum. And here you can see a similar bifurcation of the staff work, the logistics, which is more repeatable, more predictable, and then operations and plans, which are going to be more emergent, more reflective of uh, opportunities that arise as Nimitz and his forces advance. Now, in order to capitalize on this ability to straddle this strategic objectives and tactical outcomes, Nimitz introduces an unusual command arrangement for the Central Pacific. Unlike the North Pacific and the South Pacific, where he's delegated um, command arrangements to a, an area commander, here Nimitz is going to retain control, but he knows he needs a talented officer to lead um, the operations, to lead the, uh, the fleet at sea. And he chooses Vice Admiral Raymond Spruance, it's pictured here on the right, walking with Nimitz. Spruance assumes command of the Central Pacific Force. Now, the two of them have spent a great deal of time together. Nimitz uh, had Spruance join his staff after the victory at the Battle of Midway. So Spruance and Nimitz have had roughly 15 months together. They have developed a very share, uh, a set of shared assumptions about how the offensive is going to unfold and what is important about it and what is necessary to retain its momentum. And so Nimitz thinks that this is going to allow him to capitalize on his unique position as Sink Pack and Sink Poa and have Spruance be you know, the commander in the field who can execute on his vision. It will allow them to have very short feedback loops between the information that is emerging and the plans for new operations. And this works. And this works quite well. There's a very good uh, example initially in the offensive uh, during the capture of the, the Gilbert Islands and then the planning for the operation to seize the Marshall Islands. So the Gilbert Islands are seized in November 1943, part of Operation Galvanic. And that operation tests a variety of theories on which the Central Pacific Offensive rests, right? It validates that long-range land-based air power can reduce Japanese strength and help cover the advance of carrier task forces. The carrier task forces themselves prove that they can move into an island network and overwhelm Japanese defenses there. And then the amphibious assault forces prove that they can seize objectives in the face of determined Japanese resistance, especially at Tarawa. Now, however, this capture of the Gilbert Islands is always considered an intermediate objective. The real initial objective that Nimitz has been asked to, to seize are positions in the Marshall Islands. And Nimitz isn't quite sure how to do this because he doesn't have sufficient amphibious lift capacity to capture all the objectives that he thinks he needs. He knows he needs two air bases and an anchorage. 
Admiral King and the Joint Chiefs of Staff are insisting that he do it in one bite to accelerate the pace of the offensive. And Nimitz isn't sure how he can do this. But in the aftermath of the successful invasion in the Gilberts, Spruance sends the fast carriers to raid into the marshals, and that raid reveals new information. The Japanese have built a large airfield on Kwajalein Island, on the southern half of Kwajalein Atoll, that had not been anticipated. The airfield is large enough it can sustain bombers. And so that means that that atoll, Kwajalein, can become Nimitz's objective. It has two air bases, the newly discovered one at Kwajalein, another one at the twin islands of Loi Namur in the north, and it also could be a secure anchorage. An additional anchorage is planned to be seized at Majuro. Now, this is going to require an advance into the heart of the Japanese defensive network. So in December 1943, Nimitz brings his operational commanders together, Spruance, Rear Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner, who commands the amphibious forces, and Marine Major General Holland Smith. They all object to this plan. But Nimitz, confident it's going to succeed, overrules them, employs calculated risk. And the assault on Kwajalein, when it is unleashed at the end of January, collapses Japanese defenses in the marshals and forces them uh, back. It unlocks new opportunities. Spruance follows up the advantages right away, moves to capture an Iwitok further to the west and raids the Japanese fleet base at Truk. Convinced it's no longer tenable, the Japanese abandon it as a fleet base. So success in the marshals and the ability to couple tactical outcomes to strategic goals accelerates the offensive by several months. And we can see the impact of that here in this slide. So these are a series of operations that were presented either in uh, the Granite Campaign Plan, which is what uh, Nimitz and his staff were putting together, and the Reno 3 plan, uh, the draft of, of MacArthur's operations. And you can see here how each of these, both advances are accelerated by the, the shift in early 1944. So although Operation Flintlock, the assault on the Marshall Islands is, is delayed nearly a month as Nimitz works through his preparations, it allows an advance to an talk Operation Catchpole much more rapidly than anticipated. That was originally scheduled for the beginning of May. It occurs in mid-February. And this allows an additional acceleration of other operations. MacArthur's move to the Admiralty Islands comes in February instead of April. His leap to Hollandia, Operation Reckless, happens in April instead of June. And because truck is no longer tenable as a base, the operations around it, Mortlock and truck themselves are deferred, and instead, Nimitz can advance uh, to the Marianas in June instead of the anticipated date of November. So there's a significant acceleration here due to the ability to rapidly capitalize on uh, successful operations, tactical opportunities, and what they mean for strategy in, in the Pacific. Now, in this time frame, of course, the Japanese are not static. They are making their own adjustments. They are uh, reconfiguring how they would like to fight in the Pacific now that their initial line of defenses in the Marshall Islands and the fleet base of truck uh, have been uh, either captured or, or bypassed. And so they reinforce their next line of defenses in the Marianas and in the Plows. And in this phase of the offensive, uh, in the latter portion of 1944, Nimitz's command organization, his ability to make sense of changing circumstances, trigger three uh, significant adjustments that sustain the pace of the offensive. The first is that when the resistance in the Marianas, particularly on Saipan, is much greater than anticipated, Nimitz adjusts his plans for Palau, Operation Stalemate. You know, he reduces the number of target objectives to allow him to avoid the strength of Japanese defenses there and, and maintain the offense's momentum. Second, once stalemate begins, now Admiral Halsey has been installed as the commander of the Central Pacific Force, which is now, since he is in command of it, the Third Fleet. Halsey raids Japanese positions in the Central Philippines while Operation Stalemate is going on. 
The Japanese resistance there is much weaker than anticipated. Halsey suggests that there is an opportunity to move much more rapidly to the Philippines to bypass a series of intermediate objectives and to uh, advance to the island of Leyte right away. Nimitz seizes on this opportunity. He um, asks MacArthur about it, but very quickly thereafter also forwards a recommendation to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who after a very quick deliberation and uh, agreement from uh, MacArthur's Chief of Staff, MacArthur himself was at sea at the time and observing radio silence, um, agree. So now the assault on Leyte is gonna come in October of 1944, a whole series of intermediate objectives are bypassed and the offensive is accelerated once more. Now, finally, the third decision. In late September, Nimitz and his planners realize that the anticipated uh, capture of Formosa, Operation Causeway is not tenable. There are not sufficient resources, not only in Nimitz's command, but not even if Nimitz's command and MacArthur's command are combined are insufficient resources to assault Formosa. And so it's got to be, it's got to be abandoned. Um, they could get there, but then they couldn't advance beyond it. And so Nimitz shares this information with uh, King in a conference at the end of September, 1944. Planners in Washington have already come to a similar conclusion. So King is not surprised. And he immediately asks, well, what are we gonna do instead? If we don't invade Formosa, where will we go? How will we maintain the, the offense's uh, momentum? And Nimitz is ready with two suggestions from Spruance, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. They become Nimitz's next objectives. However, before Nimitz and his uh, theater can execute those operations, the Pacific Fleet has to support MacArthur's campaign in the Philippines. MacArthur's advancing from Leyte to Medoro to Luzon. And this is where the unusual command arrangements that Nimitz has introduced in the Pacific begin to show some of their flaws because now Halsey is in command of the, the Central Pacific Forces. Halsey is responsible for the fast carrier task forces. He lacks the same shared understanding that Spruance had developed, the tacit knowledge that they had um, shared together over the time discussing and preparing and planning for the Central Pacific Offensive. So instead of keeping an eye on ensuring the momentum of the offensive, its long-term viability, Halsey focuses on destroying Japanese combat power, and he nearly exhausts the carrier forces. Nimitz has to uh, remind him several times, and once with a very stern admonishment to allow sufficient time for rest and recuperation for the carrier task forces and the pilots of their planes. The strength of Japanese resistance in the Philippines uh, delays operations, slows MacArthur's and Nimitz timelines, and uh, Nimitz is forced to push back the assaults on Iwo Jima and Okinawa by a month. Now, even now, as Nimitz's forces are closing in on Japan, he is still adapting and adjusting. The Japanese use the month they have very well. They strengthen their defenses. They adopt new tactics. Their intent is not to win at the shoreline. Their intent is not to win at all. Instead, their intent is to kill and maim as many American servicemen as possible. They're hoping to draw out the war tax uh, the patience of the American people and secure a negotiated peace. And here, a, a point that I think is extremely important is that we tend to see increasing Japanese resistance at this phase of the war through the lens of fanaticism. And I think it's more important to see the, the cold calculus that they were employing. They knew the American people only had so much patience for war. They knew that defeat was coming for Germany. And if they could draw it out, they might be able to secure a peace on more on more favorable terms, and they're trying to do that. Now, their tactics are aided by failures within Nimitz's intelligence organization. They don't detect the changing Japanese tactics in time. They underestimate the number of defenders on Iwo Jima and Okinawa, and on Iwo Jima, they almost force another delay in Nimitz's timeline. But the, the Marines overcome. They allow Operation Iceberg, the assault on Okinawa, to begin on schedule. Even still, Nimitz had already dropped two objectives from it. And while the fighting ashore on Okinawa stalemates and the fleet is being subjected to a series of mass kamikaze attacks, Nimitz adjusts again 
Two major objectives are dropped from Operation Iceberg, the assault on Miyako Jima and another on Kikai Jima, because it's very clear that these aren't going to be worth the cost that they're going to impose to, to capture. And so Nimitz begins to husband his forces, prepare to make strategic carrier raids on Japan, and uh, begins to sharpen his thoughts on invasion. By late May he's, of 1945, he's opposed to it, but the army insists that it's necessary to impose a Japanese surrender. King knows this. And in early August, he forwards to Nimitz a series of messages between the Army Chief of Staff, General George Marshall, and General MacArthur, who's preparing to lead the invasion. MacArthur's being dismissive and new intelligence, suggesting stronger Japanese defenses on Kyushu, the invasion's first target, and he believes that the invasion should go forward. Nimitz is preparing his response, but two atomic bombs and the entry of the Soviet Union into the war trigger a Japanese surrender before he can do so. Now, we don't know what Nimitz would have said, but it's likely he would have made a strong case against invasion using the new information that his staff had. And in the records we do have, it's very clear that Nimitz had a low opinion of MacArthur's willingness to dismiss Japanese preparations and the strength of their fighting forces. So up until the very end of the war, we can see how Nimitz is adapting and adjusting and using the sense-making capability of his staff to maintain momentum and secure favorable outcomes for his forces. In conclusion, it's very clear that Nimitz's organizational structure, its ability to filter information, make decisions and act on them is a key piece of the ability of the Central Pacific Offensive to proceed so rapidly and adapt and adjust and overcome Japanese attempts to slow the offense's momentum. In his 1923 thesis, Nimitz quoted Rear Admiral Bradley Fisk, who argued that there's no sharp dividing line between strategy and tactics, and that the main difference between them is that the strategist sees with the eye of the mind, while the tactician sees with the eye of the body. And my argument is that by serving as both Sink Pack and Sink Poa, Nimitz is able to see with both of these eyes and rapidly couple tactical success to strategic goals. If we look at individual battles, like the Battle of the Philippine Sea or the Battle of Lady Gulf, it's, it's possible to see flaws in Nimitz's approach. The unusual command structure that he adopted with his Central Pacific forces created confusion uh, for Spruance and Halsey. There was uncertainty there, but at the strategic level, if we're looking at outcomes for the war, it has a very positive effect that outweighs some of that confusion that results in, in battle itself. So Nimitz's command and staff structure created the ability to rapidly process newly available information to better identify and seize opportunities. And that may allow Nimitz to make use of his most valuable commodity, time, and bring the war to a successful conclusion and to do it much faster than anticipated, certainly before the beginning of the Central Pacific Offensive in uh, September, 1943. So thank you. Uh, and I look forward to John's presentation. Uh, without further ado, uh, hello everyone. I'm, I too am sorry not to be there uh, today, but uh, am thankful for technology that we can do this virtually. Uh, the title of my talk today is What Was Nimitz Thinking? And this is actually a sneak preview of an article by the same name that will be coming out here very shortly in the Naval War College Review's uh, spring edition. And the, the meaning behind the title will become uh, apparent here in, in the not too distant future. So I'd like to do a number of things this morning. I'd like to talk about where did this article come from? Because it's really been a number of years uh, in gestation. Uh, and as, as part of that, I really want to get down into Nimitz's battle planning around Midway using some of the primary sources, uh, particularly the running intelligence summary of the Pacific Fleet, which is commonly known as the Gray Book. I'm going to show you some of that as we go along and really drill into Point Luck and how Point Luck shaped the battle plan for Midway and share with you what I think is 
a new interpretation around point luck. I don't think that point luck's significance has really been properly understood in any prior history of the battle. Uh, and, and frankly, I don't think it's been properly understood probably since around 1942. So I'm really kind of uh, keyed up to show you that. And then finally, I wanna look at some counterfactual scenarios that sort of flow out of this analysis using a new analytical tool that's just been uh, uh, put in our hands in the last couple of years. So without further ado, when Tony and I were sort of, Tony Tully, my co-author for Shattered Sword, um, we were putting the finishing touches on that manuscript in around 2004. And one of the things that Tony and I were pushing back against was this whole notion that the Battle of Midway had been fought against overwhelming odds and that it was a miraculous victory of some sort. And as we wrote in our conclusion in around 2004, given uh, the assets that Nimitz had to hand, we felt that his appraisal of the odds was a lot better than uh, more modern observers have, have given him credit for. And that in fact, given intelligence estimates of around you know, four or five enemy carriers, uh, Nimitz with three, if he positions those assets correctly, he was well within his rights to suppose that he could prevail in that battle as indeed he did. What we didn't really understand at that time, uh, which became clearer just a few years later when John Lundstrom came out with his uh, Black Shoe Carrier Admiral, it out to me in a, in, a, in a side conversation a number of years later. He's like, you know, John, Nimitz would have gone up to Midway even if he only had two carriers. And I was kind of like, oh, really? <laughs> that's, that's pretty gutsy. But, you know, here it is in black and white in Op 2942, which is the battle plan that Nimitz issues uh, immediately prior to the battle. That if Yorktown is not available, instructions will be issued, uh, you know, to the remainder of the forces. And so sure enough, you know, he was going to fight this battle whether Yorktown was along for the ride or not. And I sort of filed that away uh, for a number of years, but then, you know, two, three years ago, it really started to bug me. Um, because from where I sat, the notion of fighting five Japanese carriers uh, with three of our own was already, you know, getting into the gutsy realm. And two versus five felt, you know, pick your adjective, reckless, crazy, nuts, I don't know what, but it didn't seem good. And that got me thinking, you know, about what Nimitz was thinking, you know, why on earth would he be willing to accept those odds and actually give battle? And the follow on questions to that would be, well, okay, and what would have happened if uh, he had given battle at those odds? What, what might have the conclusions have been? And so that's what I want to spend the next uh, 25 minutes or so talking about. We need to get ourselves into Nimitz's perceptual frame in May of 1942, and as much as possible, try to understand what he knew, uh, what he was reacting to, what he thought he knew. Uh, and so I wanna spend the next few minutes talking about that. The first thing to be aware of is that at this point, Chester Nimitz is living in a pressure cooker. Um, the war situation, not just in the Pacific, but around the world for the Allies is absolutely catastrophic. Um, the Russians are losing on the Eastern Front. The, the Brits are being pummeled in the Mediterranean. Um, and things are obviously very bad in the Pacific as well. Nimitz's boss, Admiral uh, Ernest King, who's the commander in chief of the US Navy is likewise sitting in Washington DC and is under considerable pressure as well. And one of the things that's going on very close to home for him is the fact that the German U-boat force is turning the Eastern seaboard into a shooting gallery. So King at this point is receiving flack from the British. He is getting uh, a great deal of heat from his counterpart, uh, George Marshall. He's receiving direct criticism from uh, FDR that, you know, you've got to turn around uh, the U-boat campaign here. So King is under a great deal of pressure and funniest thing, you know, pressure has a tendency to roll downhill uh, to subordinates and King's not an easy man to work for under any circumstances, but, um, you know, Nimitz as his most important subordinate is feeling a lot of that pressure. And the relationship between these two men at this point is also still on very tenuous ground. 
King does not believe that Nimitz is sufficiently aggressive, uh, which is a, a tremendous misreading of the man, but nevertheless, that's, that's how King feels about it. And Nimitz at the same time is trying to do a fair amount of upward management to, you know, hey, back off, you know, I want to get to grips with the Japanese just as badly as you do, you know, let me do my thing here. So this is a very tumultuous time uh, for Chester Nimitz, and he is definitely feeling it. He's got to turn this situation around rapidly. The situation in terms of the balance of aircraft carriers in the Pacific looks like this at the end of the Battle of Coral Sea in early May of 1942. We've just lost Lexington, which is a very heavy blow uh, to Nimitz because We've only extracted uh, the light carrier Shoho in return for her, and that's not seen as a very good uh, exchange at that point in time. Yorktown's been damaged to some degree. We don't know what yet until she makes it back to Pearl Harbor. Saratoga's in the shop because she keeps running across enemy submarines and collecting torpedoes. Enterprise and Hornet are going to clearly be available for battle in the near term. Wasp is still out in the Atlantic. Meanwhile, on the Japanese side of the ledger, Shokaku has been very badly damaged at uh, Coral Sea. Zuikaku has had her air group shot up. But that still leaves the Japanese with their core group of their four most experienced carriers, Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, and Hiryu, uh, with which to play. Around about the middle of May, 14 May, uh, Hypo, which is the code great, uh, breaking unit at Pearl Harbor, first starts getting wind of the fact that the Japanese seem to have a new operation aimed at the Central Pacific and probably at Midway. Two days later, those estimates have firmed up. Nimitz is now on board. Two days after that, on the 18th, King likewise is basically on board as well. However, there's a great deal of back and forth between Hypo in Pearl and King's intelligence operation Op20G in DC. Op20G has very different feelings about the timing of the operation, the focus of the operation, uh, and how many assets the Japanese are going to be using in this operation. And that dialogue or debate continues for the next several weeks. On the 26th of May, uh, Enterprise and, and Hornet make it back to Pearl, and the day after that, Yorktown makes it back as well, a day early. Um, and that very night, Nimitz sits down and presents his battle plan to his senior commanders uh, over dinner. The two wild cards that are sort of in the mix at this point are, first of all, of course, Yorktown. You know, are we going to be able to patch her up in time that she can come to the fight? And the initial indications are positive, but they're not really going to know until they get her into dry dock and take a look at her at her hull to see whether she can be repaired in time. The second wild card is this uh, carrier, Zui Kaku, whose air group had been uh, beaten up pretty badly. Um, and it's possible, though, that the Japanese might have been able to conjure up a composite air group of some sort and actually sent her along to the fight. And there is an ongoing debate between Hypo and Op20G, with Hypo consistently saying Zui Kaku is not coming to the dance and Op20G saying, oh, yes, she is. And we see that laid out uh, in this uh, screen grab from the Gray Book on the 26th uh, when Nimitz puts forward his estimate of the situation. He explicitly says that Com Inch, Admiral King, his boss, his estimate is car divs one and two plus one carrier, Zui Kaku, for a total of five are gonna be coming to this operation. Whereas Sync Pack, Nimitz, is saying explicitly, no, we think there's gonna be four carriers here. The other things that Nimitz sort of has uh, in his head, uh, he is being told by his intelligence operation that the Japanese are probably going to be operating two different task groups. He knows that he's going to be able to beef up Midway's air power uh, to around 90 aircraft, roughly a carrier's worth, and he should have about a dozen fleet submarines as well. And those two groups of assets are absolutely critical to his battle plan because he knows that he's going to be at a numerical advantage, and therefore it's important that these attritional assets whittle away at that Japanese force uh, sufficiently to even those odds before he's going to want to commit his aircraft carriers. And you can see that uh, he's being driven here by a sense of not wanting to swap losses like he did at Coral Sea. Um, he says it in one passage in the Gray Book, 
you know, at the present stage of our carrier building program, we cannot afford to swap losses with this ratio. And likewise, we must husband our present carrier strength for future operations. So whatever shape this battle takes, he is telling his commanders explicitly, I do not want you losing one for one against the Japanese. We can't do that at this point in the war. The other thing that, he's, that he thinks he knows on the basis of current carrier doctrine is that one squadron of dive bombers should be sufficient to put out of action an enemy carrier. And seeing as how each one of his carriers has two squadrons of dive bombers and torpedo planes as well, he's within his rights to think that any one of his carriers theoretically has sufficient firepower to do away with two of, of their opposite numbers, assuming they can get their strikes in first, of course. So let's take a little look at the, the battle plan that emerges on 27 May, Op 2942. And it's based on the submarine plan here that comes straight out of the, out of the battle plan itself. It is assumed that the Japanese striking force, Kido Butai, is gonna come in from the Northwest uh, of the island and begin attacking it from there. And he also then designates uh, Point Luck as being the sort of the standoff position where the American carrier task forces are gonna be stationed at the beginning of the battle. And you can see it's, it's well away to the Northeast here. So the basic battle plan is, you know, any of the submarines that are along the direct axis of advance, of course, they should be you know, doing their bit and, and trying to chip away at the Japanese. Likewise, the air group on Midway should go out and do its thing. Hopefully we're gonna, you know, take, take a chunk out of Kitabutai a, a deck or two uh, before the American carriers then commit to battle and come down and try to ambush the Japanese. So now I wanna talk about Point Luck, um, which as I say, I don't think it's been properly understood uh, probably for about 80 years at this point. And I didn't really start to understand it until I began laying this out in my drawing package and taking a look at the distances involved because the bottom line is the point luck as originally defined is a hell of a long way away from where the action is supposed to be, 360 nautical miles. And if you start superimposing the strike distances of uh, both the escort fighters and the torpedo planes, they can reach out about 175 nautical miles. Dive bombers can go out another 50 nautical miles uh, further than that, but you can see we're nowhere near where the Japanese are gonna be. And that means that in order to get within strike range, we're gonna have to move those carrier forces probably around 185 miles to get within launch range. If we get lucky, maybe the Japanese force continues to close on midway, we can sort of cut the corner. Um, theoretically, we've got a, a steaming distance of about 150, but that's a low estimate because the prevailing winds are such that we are probably gonna have to move away from the Japanese during the launch cycle. Our launch cycles uh, are relatively lengthy. And so it would be irresponsible to think that you're gonna have to steam any, any less than probably 160, 170 nautical miles to get within launch range. Well, what does that mean? Well, because of that standoff distance, those carriers have got a minimum of six to eight hours of high speed steaming. And realistically, it might be closer to eight or nine hours of steaming to get within launch range, which means that even if they get word relatively early in the morning, you know, say 8 a.m., 9 a.m., uh, Naval a Air Station Midway comes back and says, things are going great, come on down. You know, the earliest that those carriers would be in range to launch would be early afternoon. And there's no guarantees that they'll have actionable uh, scouting information by that point in time either. So, you know, you could easily see it not being six to eight hours, it could be eight to nine hours. At best, we're gonna get one strike in against the Japanese. And if things don't go well in terms of scouting information, it's quite possible that the, the, ja the American carriers will not be in a position to launch at all on that first day. Which means that point luck implicitly creates the high probability of a multi-day battle, wherein day one is primarily uh, taken up by actions by those attritional assets and moving our carriers into position, maybe getting a strike in in the late afternoon, probably not, 
but then being in a position on day two to decisively engage the Japanese. In other words, a battle that is shaped much more like Coral Sea, which was a two-day affair, rather than the one-day battle that we historically got at Midway. So I think what's going on here is that Nimitz is using Point Luck as a risk management tool. It is allowing either Nimitz directly or his carrier commanders on the spot, Fletcher and Spruance, to make a definitive go-no-go -no -go decision on committing those aircraft carriers. Um, because it gives them the standoff distance necessary, they're going to be well outside of scouting range of the Japanese, that if things are going badly in the attritional phase, they can disengage those carriers cleanly before the Japanese ever get wind of the fact that they're there. So we know that Nimitz is telling his carrier commanders likewise, you know, if things are going badly, don't risk your carriers for this, leave it to the Marines, because even if the Marines lose that battle, which I don't think they will, uh, we can take back this island at any point in time. So point luck is a risk management tool. And when you then look at Point Luck's position in the context of this section from the op plan, which is one of the most famous naval orders in history, uh, where Nimitz lays out this whole principle of calculated risk is what we are going to be using to fight this battle. He says, you are not to expose your carriers to attack by superior enemy forces without good prospect of inflicting greater damage to the enemy. Well, think about it. If he starts with his carriers already within scouting range of the Japanese, as happened in the historical battle, he actually has already put his, he has exposed those forces to attack by superior enemy forces at the very outset. So understanding that point luck in the original battle plan is as far away as it is makes much better sense in the instructions that he's issuing to his, his carrier commanders. But that's not what ends up happening in the historical battle, of course, and there's a reason for that. So what ends up happening is on 30th May, Yorktown is patched up, gets sent back out. Uh, Hornet and Enterprise have departed two days prior. The day after that, Hypo conclusively determines Zuikaku is not coming to the dance. Um, and on 2 June, uh, Yorktown arrives at Point Luck with her, her sisters already there. And as soon as that happens, uh, we see from this passage in the Gray Book that Nimitz sends a suggestion to Task Force 16 and 17 that a position further to the west might be advantageous. Um, and Fletcher, being nobody's fool, understands that suggestions from four-star admirals need to be taken very, very seriously, as, as John Lundstrom also pointed out in, in his book. And so, Fletcher promptly moves his carrier forces then to the west, 175 nautical miles. And this is the position that they are going to be starting the battle in on 4 June. A lot of the accounts of Midway will actually refer to Point Luck as being here, but it's not. Point Luck never moves. It's the carriers that move as a result of that suggestion. And that puts them much closer then to uh, the point of initial contact. Now they're within about 180, 185 miles from where the Japanese are likely to show up, meaning that they're going to be able to get into the fight on day one. So what's going on here is Nimitz is breathing easier. You know, it's it's second of June. Battle has not been joined yet. I've now got three carriers on station. I know that Zuikaku's not coming. Um, so now Nimitz is willing to dial up uh, the level of risk and put his forces into more direct contact so that he can get this thing over with more quickly and bring more force to bear immediately when the battle opens. And in that way demonstrates, I think, both his aggressiveness as an admiral and his flexibility. During the actual battle, unfortunately, a number of the facets of his battle plan kind of fall apart. The attritional assets that he was counting on to even these odds, his aircraft on Midway and his submarines fail. They do not do get the job done. And likewise, the Hornet is completely ineffectual. Uh, there's this infamous moment where uh, Hornet's captain, Mark Mitcher, orders his air group to search for the Japanese in a completely incorrect uh, direction, resulting in what's called the flight to nowhere. And so Hornet contributes 
nothing uh, during the, the morning phases of the battle at all meaning that the, the battle really falls onto the shoulders of Enterprise in Yorktown. And fortunately, between the two of those carriers, they have sufficient organic firepower to get the job done and actually win the battle. So now I want to take a quick look at some of the counterfactual scenarios that fall out from this. And uh, in particular, you know, what happens if Zui Kaku had been able to come to the battle? And what might have happened if Zui Kaku shows up, but Yorktown does not, the two versus five scenario. And to do that, I wanna rely on this recent paper that came out just a couple of years ago uh, by Annalie Bongers and Jose Torres, uh, who are both um, Spanish PhD economists at the University of Malaga in, in Spain. And this was published in the Journal of uh, Military Operations Research back in 2020. And full disclosure, you know, I worked with the authors uh, to help them build the model for their initial paper. And then I worked with both of them again to extend that model to look at the two versus five scenario that we're gonna be talking about here. In a nutshell, uh, and this is using mathematics that is way above my pay grade, so bear with me, but basically uh, what they did is they built a stochastic model um, and basically laid out what are the probabilities for things like an aircraft finding its target, uh, the percentage chance that that aircraft can actually hit the target, what are the chances that the combat air patrol will intercept that aircraft and shoot it down? If the target does get hit, what kind of damage gets done to it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these probabilities are not fixed, but instead lie along a probability curve. And so um, what you do is you, you feed these variables into the model and you tune it by running 100,000 test runs and seeing you know, how things kind of lay out statistically so that the model starts to reflect the historical results of the battle. Once you've got that tuned model, uh, you can then use it to explore what ifs, and that's exactly what we're gonna do here. Crucially, uh, the authors uh, included this particular variable, which is, do we get the flight to nowhere during this particular test run? In other words, do I get good Hornet today or do I get bad Hornet, which is the historical Hornet? Uh, and you can flip that switch for any of the test runs that you want to do. So let's take the historical battle then to start with four Japanese carriers versus three American. Um, and the results from that battle, as we know, were four Japanese carriers sunk, the Yorktown sunk as well. And when we take a look at their model, they predict that given bad Hornet, historic Hornet, uh, in general, the Americans uh, should have lost one carrier with damage to another. You see the sort of faded X there. And the Japanese would lose four aircraft carriers uh, most of the time. With Good Hornet, the results of the encounter are four Japanese carriers sunk and no American carriers sunk. And there are some kind of impl interesting implications that come out of that. First of all, their model supports what Tony and I have been saying uh, throughout the, the course of, of our exposure to this battle, which is Midway was not an incredible victory. Um, that as the authors here pointed out, given um, what, what we can see from the, from the case loading, that Midway was a battle that the Japanese probably could never win and that the result was conditioned by the timing imposed by the earlier attack on Midway. And I think that this is a really important insight that I had never appreciated before, that because Nagumo uses half of his firepower first thing in the morning to go after Midway, that inevitably puts him behind the power curve for the rest of the battle. He's never able to catch up to the Americans in terms of where they're sending their firepower, which is after him. So that I think is an important uh, insight that, uh, that Bongers and Torres uh, come up with this paper. The second implication is a little more provocative. Mark Mitcher sank the Yorktown, okay, straight up. Because here's the thing, without the flight to nowhere, if you postulate that Hornet's air group had in fact attacked along with their torpedo squadron, VT-8, which attacked Kitabutai at around 920, if you imagine that two more squadrons of dive bombers had come in at the same time, it's very likely that Hornet would have been the first carrier to get a blow in that morning, probably would have sunk one or two Japanese carriers, 
leaving uh, Enterprise and Yorktown's air groups to clean up the mess in the next hour or so. If there's no key to Butai, there's no counterstrike that goes in against Yorktown. This thing could have been effectively over by lunchtime with the Americans handing the Japanese a four zip defeat and the Japanese not being in any position to respond effectively. So Mark Mitcher, uh, in essence, uh, resulted in the sinking of a friendly aircraft carrier. Now let's take a look at the five versus three scenario where Zui Kaku does make it to the dance. Um, intriguingly, even with bad Hornet, the results of this encounter are two American carriers sunk, three and a half uh, Japanese carriers sunk, which, you know, is still an American uh, victory and, you know, not uh, certainly as, as uh, overwhelming as Midway turned out to be, but, uh, you know, I think that, that uh, Nimitz would sleep fairly soundly at night with those results. And if we get good Hornet, um, we end up with five sunk Japanese carriers and one and a half uh, and a piece uh, American carriers sunk. And the implications from that, I think, are also intriguing. You know, down through the years, the presence of Zui Kaku at the battle has always been seen as sort of a nightmare scenario and that, oh, you know, it really probably could not have won if Zui Kaku had been there. But it turns out, at least looking at this model, that it would seem that Zui Kaku would not have saved Nagumo's force from very, very heavy losses. And again, this points out the importance of good scouting and getting in the first strikes. And since the Americans have such an advantage in the number of reconnaissance assets, the odds are that they are going to get those advantages uh, put in their laps. Regardless though, the Americans are pretty likely to walk away with two carriers lost as a result of that battle. And finally, we come to the true nightmare scenario, which is five Japanese carriers, two American carriers. Um, the results of that are with bad Hornet, we lose both of our carriers outright. In fact, this doesn't show you just how lopsided the firepower kills are uh, in this scenario. We just get creamed. And the Japanese lose uh, two aircraft carriers of, the, of their own, which is precisely the sort of swapping losses thing that Nimitz very much wants to avoid in this particular battle. Even with good Hornet, uh, the results are not that different. We lose both carriers outright. The Japanese lose maybe two and a half carriers. So this is not a good scenario at all for Chester Nimitz. And really represents, I, I would say, this is a carrier too far because what Nimitz didn't understand was that his attritional assets that he was really counting on were not gonna come through for him. And that means that if Yorktown is not along, the battle comes down to just Hornet and uh, Enterprise's firepower. And furthermore then, if you subtract Hornet uh, in the early morning, uh, basically it's all on Enterprise. And this is just too steep a hill to climb. The other thing that it points out is just how crucial Yorktown's presence during the actual battle actually was, that Yorktown represents the safety margin, um, that even if we get a bad performance out of Hornet, Yorktown is still there to pick up the slack uh, and provide that extra boost and firepower that was needed to come out with the results that we historically enjoyed. And so with that, I thank you very much.